My name is Adam Perryman and I'm an Associate Professor in Biomaterials at the University of Bristol um, and I'm based in the School of Cellular Molecular Medicine. And I run an interdisciplinary research group, so we have about 18 um, PhD students and postdocs and they have various backgrounds, so we have um, engineers, chemists, a physicist, a biochemists and a biologists uh, and the, the projects they work on, and they quite often work on these together, um, involve various aspects of those backgrounds. I guess really was inspired by two-dimensional printing, um, and in, this, in a similar way, um, there's, there's multiple approaches that you can use. For example, if you think about 2D printing, uh, and laser printing, inkjet printing, there's almost um, analogous uh, versions in, in 3D printing and bioprinting. So, for example, um, we, we have extrusion printing, and in this situation we have the cells that are mixed up in, in what we call a bioink, uh, and these are extruded from the head of our printer, um, layer by layer, very much in the same way that we would do it for a um, standard um, plastic 3D printer. We have laser printing, where the cells are, are put on effectively on a metal foil, um, and then that's hit the back of that foil is hit with a laser and that ejects the cells and then again we build this up layer by layer. Um, and there's also um, stereolithography where um, we have effectively in intersecting beams of light which um, creates the 3D object in, in, in space. As you would have with uh, again a 3D printer um, with plastic your printer, your printing plastic in this case, and what happens is that the plastic cord is heated up um, to form a liquid, it's printed and then it basically cools down and forms a solid. And this is how you build up layer by layer structures. Now when you have cells, and cells are dispersed in this, what we call this bioink, um, you can't um, subject them to these sorts of different temperature changes, otherwise the cells will die. So you have to come up with a way of effectively taking your cells from being in a liquid when it's being, for example, extruded from the bioink to uh, being solid. And so the way we do this is by cross-linking uh, the, the chemicals that are in the bioink. So commonly we would use different polymers um, and you, it would come out, for example, out of a syringe or out of a needle, the printer head, and then we could either use lights and cross-link the polymers using um, different colors of lights, uh, or we can do it chemically. The system we developed in Bristol has two different types of polymers. Uh, the first of which is from seaweed, so it's actually it's called sodium alginate, but it actually comes from seaweed. And the second component is a, a what's called a polaronic. Um, and what happens? We mix these up. We mix these up in, in, with media and the cells. It comes out of the printer head, and it hits a 37 degree um, stage. And as it does that, the, the temperature of the stage makes one of the components in the bioink go from a liquid into a solid. We then subsequently bring in a second cross-linking component which cross-links to the alginate, the seaweed component, and when this happens the first synthetic component comes out of the bioink. And so what you end up with is, is your 3D structure that you printed. But if you look on a microscope, an electron microscope, you can see that the actual structure itself is full of really small pores, or what we call micropores. And so we end up with our 3D structure, we end up with a very porous structure. And what this does is enables um, nutrients for the cells to be more readily um, passed through um, that the 3D printed structure, which helps keep the cell al cells alive. Um, and then we can take these cells through tissue engineering. So in our case, the cell types that we use were adult stem cells. And these are taken from, from donors, from the, um, from the Bristol Royal Infirmary. And, uh, what we can do in these situations is print the cells, and so they're still as a, in a stem cell state, and then we introduce growth factors, and we can convert the cells into, into cells that produce cartilage, called chondrocytes. And so we're able to do this entire process, it takes about five weeks, and then grow uh, the structures into, into human cartilage, um, which we then analyze to see how that compares with, with natural human cartilage. In terms, of, in terms of impact, we're, we're still developing um, the, the original system to, to look at sort of simple, simple tissues like cartilage, as I mentioned, 
uh, this is one of really the um, early stage um, targets because it's a much more simple type of tissue when you consider how complex a whole organ would be. Uh, one of the challenges with bioprinting is also including vasculature. So if you look at most organs in the, in the body, um, you have veins or arteries or microvasculature running through that. And this is very, very difficult to, to build into the design when you're trying to print something. But it's something really in the future that, that people, people are focusing on this now. So cartilage is avascular, so that's, that's a, it's still challenging, but it's not as big a challenge as a complex organ. Another whole area where bioprinting is already having impact um, is organ-on-chip type models. And so if we look at, uh, company, look at companies who want to test new drugs, at the moment we have either um, 2D models where they'll test it on cells growing on a petri dish, as a lot of people know about, or they'll be looking at animal models. One, the, the weaknesses in, there's weaknesses in both of these um, model systems. Um, a monolayer of cells is very unnatural, cells rarely exist in that state in the body. Um, with animals, there's ethical considerations in terms of using animals for testing. But also, uh, you know, when you want to test, for example, a new anti-cancer drug, you might want to test that on hu real human cells and, and cells that are in, a, um, in, a, in a, an arrangement that's much more like you'd expect. So within that space, for example, we're developing um, what are called tumor spheroids, which are um, 3D printed um, tumor models. And so we can actually, the, the objective is to take patient cells, um, grow them up and use our 3D printer to create lots of versions of these. And then we can test an array of different types of chemotherapy drugs um, to see um, how those individual patients respond and ultimately feed that information back to the NHS. Uh, and this is really this this whole area, not just in cancer, but in different uh, different types of organs, is, is really going to be probably the first um, the first have, have the first major impacts I think within the medical industry. I think the uh, you know the future really is going to be trying to develop the technology to to deal with more complex organs or more complex biological systems. Um, we have a, we're really fortunate in some ways that the, uh, the, that the technical aspects of the technique are really moving very quickly. So if we look at the types of 3D printing or bioprinting we can do now, um, there's, these are moving on very quickly as we become better at designing the actual printers themselves. There's probably 10 or 11 companies now that make commercial printers. Um, this, is, this is really helping in terms of building the scientific community and the know-how. Um, and, and more importantly, developing these, these new bioing systems. Uh, I think that in the early phases, we'll be looking at, um, again, model type systems, moving on to more simplified organ systems, as, as I touched on before, um, looking at cartilage, uh, and then ultimately moving on to the, the, the big challenges like kidneys, livers, um, hearts. Skin is a huge area. Um, already people are really driving very, very, very strongly towards trying to build 3D printed skin models for, for burn victims. Um, and skin seems like a fairly simple system, but actually when you look at the complexity and the different layers um, within just, just human skin, um, even that's a big challenge.